Before we dive into this story, I want to make it clear that it's not the scariest tale you'll ever hear. But it's sure to make you feel a mix of anger and shock. So I hope you find it interesting. I was cycling back to my house alone since my younger sister Lily was at the dentist with my mom and my dad was at his job. Our town is pretty small and quiet, so I never thought something like this could happen here. I needed to get into my garage because that's the only door I had a key for. I hurried to open the garage door, but suddenly really needed to use the bathroom. After quickly taking care of that, I came out to grab my bike. That's when I saw a woman grabbing my bike and starting to walk away with it as if it was the most normal thing in the world. I approached her and said, Excuse me, could you please return my bike? She looked at me and said, Sorry, but this bike belongs to us. I was puzzled and asked, How old is your child? She snapped back, Why should I tell you that? I tried to smooth things over by saying, I just really like this bike and thought it was the same one I was thinking of buying. Sorry for the mix-up. Surprisingly, she answered, His name's Alex, and he's eight years old. But this bike is actually meant for kids older than ten. I really need my bike back, or I'll have to call the police, I told her calmly. She began to yell, You have no right to threaten me. This is our bike, and you have no proof. I tried to stay calm and said, Please, just give me back my bike. I don't want to call the police, but I will if I have to, and yes, I do have proof. The woman started screaming even louder, claiming she'd call the police herself. At that moment, I was beyond frustrated. I warned her, go ahead, but know that I'm calling them on you for stealing my bike. Enjoy explaining that. Just then, one of my friends, Mike, who also cycles and knows my bike well, happened to come by. He saw the argument and came over to ask what was wrong. After I explained, he suggested, Call the police. I'll keep her busy. I rushed inside and dialed the police on our landline while trying to reach my mom on my cell. My mom didn't answer, so I thought, forget it. The police picked up, and I quickly explained the situation. They asked for my address and assured me officers would arrive in about ten minutes. Thanking them, I hung up and went back outside. The woman was now arguing with Mike, but he remained calm. Her son, seeing the commotion, started crying. Mommy, I want the bike! It couldn't have been more poorly timed for her because just then, the police showed up. The woman, trying to act relieved, told the officers, Thank goodness you're here. These boys were trying to steal my son's bike. When the officer asked for proof, she confidently presented a grocery receipt that included a bike bottle holder for what she claimed was her son's real bike. This was the moment she made a big mistake. I quickly tell the police officer that I have the real receipt for the bike. I dash inside, rummage through a box for what feels like forever, and finally, there it is. I run back outside, waving the receipt at the officer. The officer looks over the receipt and then at the woman, saying, Ma'am, you've made a mistake from the start. If you claim to have bought this just an hour ago, and you're on your way home now, you wouldn't have had the time to attach this to the bike yet. And just like that, She's handcuffed. The officer then asks if my parents are around. I shake my head, saying they're not home yet. He advises me to call them, so I do. My dad arrives in about half an hour, but my mom is still out for another hour. When my dad gets there, he talks to the officer, and a week later, we're informed that the woman has been sentenced to jail for two months and has to do community service for five weeks. Turns out, she was also caught stealing candy for her sweet little angel and even slapped another child's mother for not sharing their candy. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And that's where this part of the story wraps up. My dad gave me the option to press charges since I was directly affected by her actions. With my temper flaring up from the incident, I didn't hesitate to say yes. I hadn't felt so enraged in a long time. If there's anything to take away from this ordeal, it's a simple lesson. Don't steal or engage in illegal activities. It's just not worth it. This story began just two nights back. At about eight in the evening, my boyfriend had left for his night job, and the repair guys had just installed a new refrigerator in our apartment's kitchen. All my food was in the sink since I had nowhere else to put it. But I didn't have any ice to keep it cold, so I called up my sister for help. I was all by myself in the apartment when suddenly there was a knock on the door. 
As I was asking my sister over the phone to bring some ice, I went to open the door, guessing it might be one of the repair team who had perhaps left something behind. But no, standing there was not someone I recognized. It was an old man, clearly drunk, wearing a huge jacket despite the heat. Now, keep in mind, I'm not very big or strong. I barely weigh over 90 pounds and I'm just over 5 feet tall. I'm an artist, I don't work a regular job, and I sell what I create. This kind of scary encounter was new to me. Can I use your bathroom? I really don't want to go outside, he slurred, stepping closer. I panicked a bit and replied, I'm sorry, my boyfriend's in the shower, trying to close the door slowly. But before I could shut it, he lunged forward, blocking the door with his foot, preventing me from closing it. I was terrified, pushed the door as hard as I could, and dashed to my room to grab the metal bat I keep for safety. By the time I was back, ready to defend myself, my sister and her friend had arrived with the ice. Seeing them, I just collapsed, crying. My sister told me that as they were coming up, they saw the man running off. I didn't call the police, though I told myself I would if I ever saw him again. I knew I should have been more cautious. Later, when I told my boyfriend what happened, he pointed out something chilling. If no one has lived here for years, and our apartment is on the second floor, why would that man come to our door? That thought alone sent shivers down my spine. Before I share my story, there are a couple of things you should know to really get what happened. I'm from France, and this took place in a quiet part of the countryside. Around there, people are so trusting that they rarely lock their doors, thinking nobody would enter their homes without permission. Let's go back to the summer of 2019. I was staying at a holiday house, a big two-floor home owned by a friend of my mom. I was there with my mom, her friends, and their dog, relaxing before I had to go back to work. We'd been enjoying our time for about five days when they all wanted to go out to eat. I didn't feel like going, so I stayed behind. They took off, and I was left alone, eating my dinner and watching TV. That's when I got this weird feeling. You know? The kind you get after watching too many scary movies and thinking, uh-oh, something bad's gonna happen. This place had these big glass doors that opened up to the garden, which didn't help my nerves. After I finished eating, I decided to head upstairs and lock myself in my bedroom, because the uneasy feeling wouldn't go away. But first, I went to check the front and back doors of the house. Turns out the front door was wide open. Around here, that's not usually a big deal, so I didn't freak out over it. The thing is, it wasn't just open, it was unlocked. Even so, I shrugged it off, thinking it wasn't a big deal. I mean, who would just walk in, right? Then I checked the windows, found one open so I locked it and headed back to my room. All this time, I kept hearing strange sounds inside and around the house. I tried to convince myself it was just my imagination playing tricks on me because of all the scary stuff I'd watched. So there I was, trying to shake off the fear, reminding myself I'm in a safe, familiar place despite the odd noises and the open door. The countryside's supposed to be peaceful, right? But as the night grew darker, that feeling of dread just wouldn't leave me. As I finished locking up, I kept hearing sounds from inside and outside the house. I tried to tell myself these were just the normal creaks and groans of an old house settling into the night. I was trying hard to ignore them, but it wasn't easy. Once I got to my room, I decided to call a friend thinking that having someone to chat with would calm my nerves. We talked for about an hour, but then suddenly she couldn't hear me anymore. My phone just cut off. It was odd because I've never had signal problems here before. That's when I started to really worry. I felt completely cut off, with my phone and computer both somehow not working, and those unexplained noises still going on. About ten minutes after my call dropped, I heard what sounded like a bunch of people downstairs and even thought I heard my mom calling out to me. Confused and a bit scared, I went down to check, thinking it couldn't be possible. You see, I was the only one with a key to the door. How could anyone get inside? As I reached the bottom of the stairs, I saw figures moving and heard voices. I called out to my mom asking how she got in. She told me they came in through a poolside window that I'd left open. But that couldn't be right. I was sure I'd locked it. My mom brushed it off, thinking I was just being paranoid, 
but I couldn't shake the feeling that someone else had been in the house. We hadn't noticed anything missing, yet the noises I'd heard and the open window were too strange to ignore. I was convinced someone had sneaked into the house while I was alone. This belief just made the whole situation scarier. I couldn't stop thinking about who might have been inside the house, moving silently in the darkness. The idea that someone could be wandering around, perhaps watching us, was terrifying. And the worst part? There was no way to prove it. The night had taken a turn from peaceful to something right out of a horror story. And I was living it. Unable to shake off the fear that something, or someone, had invaded our safe space. I live far away from the city with my mom and two sisters. One night, we all had a big argument over something as silly as pizza, and my mom and sisters got so mad they left me all by myself at home. I was really upset. I won't talk about the fight, because now I see I was in the wrong, and it was a stupid thing to argue about. As a teenager who often gets moody, it's tough to admit I was wrong. So, there I was, feeling angry, sitting alone in my room in the dark. I was stewing in my anger for about an hour before I got tired of just sitting around. So I decided to play some games on my phone. My family still hadn't come back, and I guessed that because they were gone for so long, they might have gone to see our grandparents. They usually visit them on Friday nights. I was trying to distract myself when suddenly I started to hear noises. It sounded like it was coming from outside. It was like a group of people were getting closer to our house their voices mixing together into a constant murmur. I peeked through the curtain and saw a group of people coming out of the woods toward our house. They were all wearing black clothes that looked like robes. At first I thought it would be scary, but they were laughing and talking so much that I was more curious than afraid. I wondered who they were and why they were dressed in such a strange way. They didn't seem dangerous. I kept watching from the darkness of my room as they came closer and finally stopped right in front of our house. Then I understood they weren't just passing by. They had come here with a reason, and now they were outside, looking around our house. In that moment, I thought maybe they were here for some kind of strange ceremony, like they were part of a cult, and I was the one they had chosen for something. I kept telling myself it was all nonsense, thinking I should call my mom. But I was still so mad at her, so I decided I didn't want to call. I thought I could face whatever this was on my own. I was still full of anger, feeling it rushing through me, so I ran downstairs when I heard sounds at the door, like someone trying to open it. I grabbed all the knives in the kitchen, holding them like a movie monster ready to attack. Then, I swung open the door to the backyard, surprising the people messing with the lock. I screamed at the top of my lungs, knife in hand. I didn't know what would happen next. Maybe I was bold because I was so angry, but my yell cut through the quiet night. And the person just looked at me and said, Sorry, wrong house. Then they all ran off back into the woods. I couldn't believe I had scared them away all by myself. Hours later, when my family came home and I had calmed down, I said sorry for the fight. Then I told them what had happened. They didn't believe me, though, and we soon forgot all about it. But, three years later, I saw in the news that a group wearing hoods was breaking into houses, hurting people, and taking things. There was even a story about a man found dead in the woods. I keep thinking, what if I hadn't surprised them? Would I still be here? Could my anger have led to something really bad happening to me? What if they had gotten into our house? It's scary to think about what could have happened. I lived in a one-floor house in a small town far from the big city. I was still staying with my mom while attending the local college because it saved money, and my mom needed help since she wasn't in good health. My dad traveled a lot for work, so I had to take care of everything at home. One night around 2 a.m., I suddenly woke up feeling like something wasn't right, as if there was someone or something inside our house. The moon was shining bright, and a strong wind was blowing outside, making the trees whisper loudly. I stayed in bed for a bit listening hard to see if I could hear any sounds from inside the house. But all I could hear was the wind and the leaves. Still, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was wrong. After gathering my bravery, I decided to check it out. I slowly opened my door and tiptoed through the hallway, using the moon's light to see. When I got near the front of the house, 
I noticed the door was slightly open, moving back and forth, hitting a metal stand we had near it. Right then, a terrible smell hit me, making me feel like I was going to throw up. It took all my courage to move closer and shut the door. Then, I turned on every light in the house, one by one, looking around for any signs of an intruder. My heart was racing as I checked each room. When I got to the dining room, I found what was causing the awful smell. There, on our expensive rug, was a pile of what looked like chewed up figs. It turns out a wild dog had eaten too many figs that fell from the trees in our yard and somehow got into our house because the wind had blown the door open. It seems like it left its mess and ran away when it heard me moving around. This story happened a few years back when I was living with my former boyfriend. We had just moved into a small two-bedroom house and were excited about making it feel like our own place. We decided to use the extra bedroom as a study, because there was only one bathroom in the house, and you had to go through that bedroom to get to it. Often our friends would stay over, sleeping on the couch in the living room. We didn't like the idea of them having to walk through our bedroom if they needed to use the bathroom late at night. So after living there for about a month, something strange happened. My boyfriend was out that night, hanging out with his co-workers, leaving me by myself. I spent the evening watching TV and enjoying some food delivery. A couple of times during the night, I heard weird sounds, but I didn't pay much attention to them. Whenever I tried to listen closely to figure out what they were, they would stop. It got later, and I decided to spend some time on the computer in the study before going to sleep. Back then, we didn't have a landline yet, and my mobile phone was out of credit. I basically had no way to call or message anyone while I was alone in the house. I was sitting in the study, the room lit only by a small lamp that didn't give off much light, working on my laptop. Then I heard noises again. It started as a soft clattering sound. So quiet I wasn't sure if I was actually hearing it or just imagining things. I turned off my music and tried to figure out where the sound was coming from. I walked into our bedroom and looked down towards the front door. No one was there. I went back to the study, but it was hard to see anything outside the window. Our backyard was enclosed by a tall brick wall and had a big wooden gate, and there were no lights to illuminate it. From the little I could see, there didn't seem to be anything or anyone out there either. I sat back down and turned my music back on. About ten minutes later, I heard a chilling noise like metal scraping against metal. It was very soft, almost as if whatever was making the noise was trying to do so quietly. At this point, I was starting to get really scared. So I quietly went to our bedroom to get a heavy metal rod we found when we were fixing the closet. I didn't turn on any lights because I didn't want to show where I was if someone was really inside the house. Remember, I couldn't call anyone for help, and I was starting to worry that someone might actually be in my house. I went back to the study, which was also our bedroom, and closed the door as silently as I could. Then, I locked it and put a chair under the doorknob to keep it closed. Nothing happened for about twenty minutes. I started to feel silly for being so scared, and thought it was just because I was alone in the house for the first time. But I didn't turn my music back on. That turned out to be a good thing, because I soon heard what sounded like two men whispering. They didn't seem to be inside the house. The window of the study was open a little, and their voices seemed to come from there. I went to the bathroom to try and see better into the alley behind our house. The study and the bathroom were shaped like an L around the yard, and the bathroom stuck out more. I climbed onto the window ledge and opened the window a bit more to look into the alley. I couldn't see anything, but the whispering was clear and coming from right behind my gate. I couldn't make out everything they said, but I heard enough to know they noticed we had moved in and talked about our valuable stuff like guitars, computers, cameras, TVs, and game consoles. They probably knew I was alone and were waiting for me to fall asleep before trying to get in. I stayed there, frozen, until a sudden loud bang made me jump. They were done trying to be quiet and were hitting my gate, trying to break it. The gate shook with each hit, and I could only guess how big these men were. I'm not very big, just over five feet tall and weighing about a hundred pounds. I was terrified. As I watched the gate almost give way, I held the metal rod tightly, trying to think of a place to hide. Then, suddenly, a bright light blinded me. At first I thought they were shining a light into the house but then I heard dogs barking and people shouting. 
I looked again and saw that the house across the alley had turned on a floodlight. It lit up their yard, my yard, and the alley. I heard the men grumble and then footsteps as they ran down the alley. I stayed in that room until my ex came home around four in the morning. I couldn't sleep at all that night. In the morning, when I checked the yard, I saw that the gate was barely hanging on. It was easy to get in from the alley. The lock was scratched as if someone had tried to pick it. If the neighbors hadn't turned on their light, I can't imagine what might have happened. I've seen a lot of scary stuff in my life, but let me tell you about one thing that happened when I was 11. My mom, dad, and sister went out to shop, and I stayed home alone with my dog, Max. I was in my bedroom, reading a book, with Max sleeping on the floor, when suddenly he woke up and started growling at a corner of the room. I shared my room with my little sister, Annie. Her bed was right by that corner, covered in toys and stuffed animals. So at first, I thought Max was just growling at one of the toys. I picked up the biggest stuffed animal and showed it to Max, hoping he'd calm down. But Max didn't care about the stuffed animal. He kept staring and growling at the corner, his fur standing up. That's when I knew something weird was happening. Max moved toward the corner, tried to get closer three times, but each time, he yelped like he was hurt and jumped back. I was really scared but tried to stay calm and I shouted, Go away! Don't scare me anymore! And you won't believe it. But everything stopped. Max went to the corner again, more carefully this time, sniffing around. There was nothing there, though. I couldn't wait to tell my parents when they got back. I was so scared. I begged them not to leave me alone in the house again. They looked around my room but said Max must have been barking at the toys. I'm sure it wasn't just the toys. Max was usually so quiet and never acted like this. It felt like he saw or sensed something I couldn't. It felt evil. Really bad. I don't know how else to describe it. It seemed like something was hurting Max or keeping him away. I never really knew what being scared meant until one night in fall when I was eight. I used to watch scary movies a lot. My dad would get them for me even though my mom didn't like it. I thought it was exciting when the music in the movies got scary and you knew something was about to happen that the person in the movie couldn't see. That kind of scared was fun, but what I felt on that night was different, really different. I lived in a town north of Toronto. It was a pretty place with a big house that I still think of as home, even after 17 years. The town wasn't small, but it felt safe. We heard stories about strangers hiding in the woods or near the town, and since I had sisters we were always told to be careful. We were told to always lock the doors, not talk to strangers, and never get into cars with people we didn't know. The leaves on the trees started to turn red and orange at the start of fall and it got dark early. One evening, when it was already dark, my parents and my older sister were out. That left me and my sister Kay at home. Kay wanted to meet a friend and asked me to come with her halfway. It should have only taken five minutes to meet her friend, but it felt like a big adventure. Kay couldn't find her friend's house, and we ended up looking around for a while. While Kay kept looking, I remembered that my parents had a spare key in the garage for emergencies. The garage wasn't directly connected to the house. To get inside, you had to open the big garage door, because there was no door from the garage into the house, only a side door. Since I didn't have the key, I opened the big garage door. When I found the key and was about to close the garage, I saw car lights. I thought it might be my family coming back, but it wasn't. A beige van had stopped in our driveway, not far from where I stood. I heard the sound of a window opening and a car door. Then I saw a man. He had his arm and upper body out of the window, holding the door slightly open, as if ready to jump out. He was a very big man, with no hair at all, and a small beard just on his chin. It seemed to take forever before he spoke. His voice sounded kind of friendly, but now that I'm older, I think maybe he was excited in a bad way. He asked if I was home alone. That's when I got really scared, the kind of scared you can't move from. I was just a little kid and there was nobody around, no cars, no adults, nothing. It felt like I was watching this happen to someone else, not me. Things like this don't really happen, I thought. Then I heard a strange sound, but I was still too scared to move. 
Suddenly, the man got back into his van and drove away fast. My sister had opened the front door, and maybe he got scared someone else was there. Later, my parents got home and we told the police. But they never found the man. After that, there were stories in the neighborhood about other scary things happening. I don't like to think about what could have happened if my sister hadn't come to the door. I really hope I never see that man again. And I hope no other kid does either. A few days back, I was at home trying to study for a test. I was feeling really stressed and couldn't keep my mind on the books. It was around the middle of the day when suddenly the doorbell rang. I walked over and opened the door to see a guy standing there, looking to be in his thirties, of a normal height and build, dressed like someone who fixes things for a living. He asked if my parents were around, because he needed fifty dollars to repair a pipe. I told him they weren't home, and he wanted to know when they would be back. I explained that I lived with my boyfriend, and questioned why he was asking for money since we had just paid the building manager thirty-five dollars. He claimed it was for a different issue, saying it was urgent because our neighbors had complained about our side of the building having broken gutters, causing water to leak onto the windows. He suggested I discuss it with my boyfriend, and ask me to get the money, urging me to do it quickly because it was an emergency. I shut the door, a bit shaken, and texted my boyfriend about it, sensing something was off. Was it a pipe or the gutters? I wanted to ask the man for more details, like which neighbors complained, if he could give me a receipt, and the total cost. But I was starting to feel frightened. I'm not very big, and I look younger than my 22 years. Which is probably why he asked for my parents. There was something off about the way he spoke, too. Kind of threatening and unhinged. And I couldn't believe I'd told him I was alone. But he was insistent, asking to speak to anyone else at home. Following my gut, I texted my boyfriend who said he'd be back in an hour. I didn't give him all the details since the man was still outside. I decided to open the door again, thinking it better to deal with him than to upset him by ignoring him. Our door is just a simple, old wooden one, and our apartment isn't the best, so I didn't feel all that safe. There I was, telling the man my boyfriend would be back in an hour and apologizing for any trouble. He said it was okay and that he'd return later, but he didn't walk away right then. He began asking about our rent, if we were working or studying, but I gave him short answers. I said we were both students and workers, but didn't go into details or tell him how much we paid for the place. Then, he shifted the topic, asking if I knew any other girls around my age who were single and looking for someone. He said he was a decent man from the city, finding it hard to meet a nice woman. He spent what felt like forever on this, trying to get phone numbers of any girl who might not reject him. I tried to be polite, telling him all my friends were about my age and already in relationships. He kept asking, but I stuck to my story, and eventually, he dropped it. He asked if my boyfriend and I had been together long, and when I said two years, he wished us a long and happy future together. Before leaving, he wanted to know where the building manager lived, and I told him. After he left, I shared everything with my boyfriend, who rushed home, convinced we were targeted for a scam. I was terrified. I had shared too much while trying to keep the situation calm. My boyfriend confirmed it was a scam and went to speak with the building manager. She informed him the man had also tried to scam her out of $15, claiming I sent him. She was aware of his intentions and advised us just to be cautious. Now I'm frightened. It feels like he's casing the building for a robbery. He got inside somehow, checking doors and seemed to pick ours, probably because it looked weak. Asking for money might have been a test to see if we had cash handy or to gauge if we're wealthy and if it's worth breaking into our apartment. It's puzzling why he chose us when there are many other apartments he could have targeted. Strangely, he seemed almost kind towards me. Calm, not pushing hard for the money, and seemingly shifting his focus from trying to scam me to aiming at my boyfriend or parents. Despite his calm demeanor, we've been living in fear keeping doors open to hear any break-ins and trying not to leave the apartment alone for too long. It's like we're trapped in a nightmare, always on edge. Let me start this story by sharing a little about myself. I'm a 19-year-old guy living in Sydney, Australia. Just so you know, I'm not the tallest or strongest person around, standing at 5-8 inches and not very built. Because of this, I've always felt a bit powerless when faced with bigger people, 
which is why I spent most of my teenage years inside where I felt safe. But there was this one time when everything I thought about feeling safe was completely shattered. This happened when I was 17. My parents were away for the weekend celebrating their 20th wedding anniversary. I have three siblings, two older brothers who have their own places, and a younger sister who was staying at a friend's house that weekend. So I was alone at home. And I was okay with that. I could never have imagined the terror that was about to unfold. Words can't capture the fear I experienced. I had read stories about people facing scary situations, but I never really got it until that night. It was about 11 p.m. on a Saturday. I was upstairs watching my favorite show when I thought I heard a noise from downstairs. I paused my show to listen better. It sounded like a soft knock or tap at the front door. Being the paranoid person I am, I usually imagine the worst in these situations. But this time, I ignored the noise and kept watching my show. After a few more episodes, I went downstairs to grab a drink. The stairs in my house faced the front door directly. To the left of the stairs is a tiny hallway that leads to a bigger area with the kitchen and living room. The hallway is so small, you can see into the kitchen from the door. When I got downstairs, I noticed the front door was unlocked. The lock was horizontal, which was a clear sign. I was sure I had locked it after my parents left, even double-checked because I'm always cautious. Yet, I locked it again and brushed off the concern. After finishing my drink, I was tired and decided to go to bed. I turned off all the lights, as was my habit before sleeping. About twenty minutes later, I woke up to the sound of a door closing downstairs. It couldn't have been the front door since I had locked it. And only my parents had another key. I've watched enough scary movies to know you should never check out weird noises, especially when every part of you screams to stay put. But in my sleepy state, I made a poor choice. I tiptoed downstairs, trying to be as quiet as possible aware that some steps creak if you step in the middle. So I carefully moved, staying as close to the wall as I could while going down the stairs. My heart was beating so fast, it felt like it was going to jump out of my chest. By then, my eyes got used to the dark, and I could see the shape of the furniture in my house. Looking back, I think that's what kept me alive. If I had hit something, it would have made noise and revealed where I was. Peeking around the corner of the stairs, I can't even describe how scared I was when I saw a man in my kitchen. He was huge, over six feet tall and strong looking. I felt a chill go through me, like I was in ice. I couldn't move, frozen with fear. He hadn't noticed me because he didn't react at all. When I could finally move, I quietly stepped back, trying not to make any noise. I was terrified, knowing that any noise could be the end of me. Feeling like every step might be your last is something I wouldn't wish on anyone. As I got closer to my bedroom upstairs, my heart was pounding so hard, then I heard a loud creak. I knew I was in trouble. My whole life seemed to flash before my eyes. I ran to my room and shut the door. The scariest part was that none of the doors in our house had locks, not even the bathroom. He just had to turn the doorknob to my room, and I'd be caught. Hearing heavy steps coming up the stairs made me think this was it. I looked around my room for anything to defend myself with. The only thing I found was a pen on my desk. I grabbed it so tight, my hands started to lose blood flow. I was ready for anything. Then the most terrifying moment happened. A deep voice outside my door said, I know you're in there and I'm going to kill you. Suddenly the door flew open. Without thinking, I swung my arm and managed to stab the pen into the guy's shoulder. He screamed in pain and fell. I ran out of the room, down the stairs, and out the front door, straight to my neighbor's house. I kept knocking until they answered. After I told them what happened, they called the police, and I stayed with them until the police came. When the police checked my house, the man was gone. I still don't know if they ever caught him. But thankfully, I haven't seen him since. When I was around nine years old, something happened that I can't forget even now, and I'm 25. It still makes my skin crawl thinking about it. I lived in a house connected with three others, making four houses in a row, in a place with many such houses close by. Each house had a little yard at the back. Not far from my backyard, there was a small path where people liked to walk. 
especially on Sundays. A tiny fence was all that separated my yard from that path. So, seeing folks walk by was normal, but finding someone standing in my yard was definitely not. Back when I was nine, I used to get home from school about an hour before my mom did from her job. My school was pretty close, just a short walk, so my mom thought it was okay for me to be home alone for a little while. One day, after school, I did what I always did, made sure the front door was locked and checked the back door to the yard too. Being alone was a bit spooky, even if it was just for an hour in the afternoon. I hurried to my room upstairs to play video games on my PlayStation, trying to enjoy as much time as I could before my mom came home and it was time for homework. While playing, I heard a strange noise from outside my window. My room looked out over the yard and the path I mentioned. The noise sounded like cats fighting or something. My cat had been gone for over three months and I suddenly hoped maybe he had come back. I ran downstairs to see if it was my cat, but what I saw instead still haunts me. There was a man standing in my yard, really tall, with dark hair hanging over one of his eyes. Kind of like that scary girl from a horror movie. He was making weird, high-pitched noises, almost like a cat's meow. There was dark brown spit dripping from his mouth. He was chewing on something that looked like my dad's crushed cigarette butts from the ashtray outside. I was so shocked I couldn't move for a moment. Then I screamed, hoping to scare him off, but he didn't even flinch. He just kept picking at the ashtray and eating what he found. I ran back up to my room, locked the door, and called my mom, who then called the police. I've never been so scared, hiding under my bed covers, shaking from fear, listening to those awful sounds the man made, eating cigarette butts from our ashtray. I sort of passed out from the fear, because the next thing I remember was the sound of police cars outside by the path near our yard. I listened as the police shouted at the man, warning him to come towards them or face arrest. He didn't reply, but the strange high noises he was making got louder and more frequent. Feeling a bit braver with the police there, I peeked through the window. I could see two officers, a man and a woman standing by my fence. The scary man was out of sight, directly below my window, so I couldn't see him. Suddenly the police climbed over the fence. That's when the man screamed louder than anything I've ever heard. He ran at the female officer and hit her so hard she fell down, not moving. The other officer quickly used his taser on the man, who fell to the ground still screaming. It was tough, but the policeman managed to handcuff him. He then helped the female officer wake up. She looked really hurt. The male officer called for more police and an ambulance. When he looked up and saw me watching, he seemed surprised and told me he hoped I hadn't seen everything. That made me start crying. Neighbors came to see what was happening. An old lady from next door took care of me until my mom came home. The police took the man away and said they'd come back to explain everything. Later that night, a policeman came to talk to us. He told us the man on my patio had severe autism. He had escaped from a place for people with mental challenges about 5 km away. He used to live in my house with his mom until she died five years ago. The man probably thought he could find his mom in our house. He missed his old life and his mom a lot. The officer explained the man was very strong because of his autism, which made his muscles get stronger over time. That's why he acted so violently when the police showed up. I was really scared and told the officer he needed to make sure this wouldn't happen again. He promised it wouldn't. After that, life went back to normal for three years. The man didn't come back until a year ago. By then, I had bought the house for my parents and was living there on my own. One morning, while I was having coffee on the patio, I noticed a man stopping by the fence. He stared at me. I nodded at him, and then I heard those high-pitched noises again. When I recognized him, my heart skipped a beat. His hair was now gray, but those unique high sounds he made were unmistakable. My mind raced back to that scary day years ago, but this time, I felt a mix of fear and pity. After all these years, he had returned, probably still looking for the comfort of his old home and his mom. I hesitated but then asked if he wanted to come into the yard. Surprisingly, he hopped over the fence quickly. I braced myself, remembering how he had knocked down that police officer. But he didn't act aggressive. Instead, he smiled at me, and I couldn't help but smile back. I invited him to sit down, and though he didn't speak, his smile widened. When I suggested we go inside, he laughed, a sound full of genuine happiness. Once we were inside, 
I saw his expression change to one of pure joy. It was clear he remembered living here with his mom. The sight nearly brought me to tears. He sat on the sofa, turned on the TV, and found his way to the cartoon channel like he belonged here. Watching him, so absorbed and happy, I felt a profound sense of peace. I knew I needed to contact his care facility, yet I wanted him to enjoy this moment of nostalgia. The staff from the facility arrived in about ten minutes. It took some convincing, but eventually, he stood up, tears streaming down his face, and left with them. Two days later, I called the facility. We came to an understanding. His name is Tom, and now I consider Tom a friend. Since that day, Tom and his caretakers visit me every Sunday to watch cartoons together. They tell me it's the best part of his week, and knowing this fills me with warmth. What used to be a frightening memory has turned into a beautiful friendship. My Sundays have changed from fear to anticipation. My friend Tom, who once brought fear, now brings joy and companionship into my life. When I was little, I lived in a small town not too far from the big city lights. My family moved there when I was just seven because my mom got a new job. Before that, she worked in a bike shop in another town, but it didn't make enough money for us. Fast forward five years, and I was in middle school with a younger brother who was two years younger than me. My mom had to work very late at her job because she was still new there, so my brother and I were home alone a lot after school. Our evenings were pretty simple. We'd skip our homework, heat up some food from the fridge, and watch TV, usually wrestling or cartoons. We tried to be in bed before mom came home, but sometimes we stayed up late to see her. One day, while it was still bright outside, everything was normal at first. My brother was watching TV, sitting on the floor of the living room, totally into it and I was on my mom's computer, taking care of my online pets. Then suddenly, there was a loud knock on the door. It was strange because neither of us had many friends, and we lived in a place where mostly older people lived. The knocking was too loud and seemed urgent. It scared me a bit because we weren't expecting anyone. I looked at my brother, and he looked back at me, both of us feeling a bit uneasy. We weren't supposed to open the door for strangers, but the knocking didn't stop. It got louder and more persistent, as if whoever was on the other side really needed to get in. I decided to get up and check through the peephole, my heart beating fast. What I saw on the other side chilled me to the bone, setting the stage for a night we would never forget. But let me tell you more about how it all started to go wrong from that point on. My mom was the youngest person around our place, only in her thirties. When the knocking started, my brother, too short to see through the door's peephole, just stared at me, waiting to see what I would do. I left the computer and went to the door, curious but cautious to look through the small hole. There, right on the other side, was a man wearing a black ski mask, looking straight back at me as if he could see through the door. It felt unreal, like a scene from a movie where the bad guy shows up to rob a bank. Fear took over me instantly, and I didn't even think about asking who it was. Silently, I turned off the TV grabbed my brother and our little black dog, and we all hid in my bedroom closet. Hiding there, I told my brother about the scary man outside. He didn't say much, just hugged our dog tightly, looking really scared. I took out the emergency flip phone my mom left us for situations just like this, and quietly called 911, trying not to make any noise in case the man was still nearby. The operator seemed to understand my whispered fears and promised to send someone right away. After hanging up, I called my mom to tell her what was happening. She was worried and left work immediately, arriving back just as the police showed up. But by then, the man had disappeared. The police officer didn't seem to take us seriously, thinking maybe we were just two kids scared of being alone. He suggested maybe someone was playing a prank, but who would do that in a place where mostly older people lived? That scary encounter with the masked man was the first and last time we saw him, but it wasn't the end of our troubles. Our house was broken into after that, and my car was targeted three times. Luckily, we were never home when those break-ins happened. Eventually, my family decided it was time to move to a different state and get a security system to feel safe again. The memory of that day, the fear, and the feeling of being watched stayed with us, reminding us that sometimes the world can be a very scary place. One night. I was at my house. 
my mom was sleeping, so it felt like I was by myself. I was eight years old and I had to take the garbage out, even though it was already dark. Suddenly, a hand came out from the side of our back porch and grabbed my leg, pulling me hard. I yelled as loud as I could and they let go. I rushed back into the house. The first time I was alone at home with my younger brother, I was around 13. My parents went out to a music show and left me to take care of him. After I put him to bed, there was a loud knock on our front door. I felt really scared and quietly moved to see who it was through the window. It turned out to be a neighbor from further down our street. We didn't talk much. He had never come to our house before, and I couldn't figure out why he would want to come now. I stood quietly behind the door and told him, My parents are not here. I can't let you in. I thought it was a bad idea to tell a stranger that no adults were around, but he just shouted back saying, It's getting dark. I just wanted to tell you that your garage door is completely open. I felt silly afterwards, but hey, I was still safe. I spent the evening watching ghost shows on TV, all by myself at home, and went to sleep with those stories in my head. That night, I suddenly woke up to complete darkness and the sound of a child either singing or whistling close by. Fear grabbed me, making me sweat and almost cry. From the ghost shows, I remembered they would speak to the ghost to calm it down. So, with a voice full of fear, I asked, Who are you? My dog Rex just snorted licked his mouth and fell asleep again. Turns out he had been snoring all along, and it was his nose making that whistling sound. I was alone at home after having dinner with my friend, and around 3 a.m., I heard a very loud noise. My cat and I got out of bed to look around, hoping to find what made the noise. We looked for about 15 to 20 minutes but found nothing. We went back to bed and not even ten minutes passed when there was another loud noise. This time I was really scared. It sounded like it came from the same place, and I stayed awake all night, too frightened to move. The next day, I discovered that my friend had put two fizzy drinks in the freezer to cool them down, forgot about them, and then left. She didn't tell me about it. They exploded, and that's what kept me awake all night. When I was about 11 years old, one day during summer, I was by myself at home, eating Skittles and watching TV. I threw a lot into my mouth and chewed them into a kind of big sweet lump. Suddenly, something on TV made me laugh, and I swallowed the lump by accident. It wasn't super big, but big enough to block my throat and stop me from breathing. It was really scary because no one else was there to help, and I started to freak out. I remembered a cartoon where a character who couldn't breathe hit their belly against something hard to make the stuck thing come out. So I began slamming my belly against the corner of our chair. Even if I might not have done it perfectly, it worked, and the lump of Skittles flew out. That moment was one of the most frightening in my life because I truly thought I might die, all alone. That fear sticks with me, especially the thought of choking when no one's around and not being found for days. One time I was all by myself in an old shed. It was just me there, taking care of my horse, brushing its coat and making sure it was clean. Suddenly, without any warning, I felt something weird. It was like my whole body knew something was wrong. The tiny hairs on my neck stood straight up, and I felt like I needed to either fight or run away fast. When I spun around, there was this guy I had never seen before. He was just standing there in the entrance, staring at me with a strange smile that made me feel uncomfortable. He told me he was the boyfriend of a lady who also had a horse at this place, and he started to talk while walking closer to me. My horse, which is usually very calm and doesn't get scared easily, began to act very strange. It moved around me, acting nervous and scared, and then it stood between me and this man, blocking his way to me. That was when I knew I had to leave. I didn't think twice. I just climbed onto my horse and we ran away as fast as we could into the nearby forest. I was sure that this man wanted to do something bad to me.
I live at the end of a small, closed road. My room is upstairs. One night I woke up because I needed to use the bathroom. It was about three in the morning. We were expecting a lot of snow that night, so I looked out of my window to see how much had fallen. It was a lot. The snow was taller than the edge of the sidewalk. Everything was covered in white. I felt thirsty, so I decided to get a glass of water. I went downstairs, turned on the kitchen light, and filled a glass with water from the tap. I was only downstairs for around four minutes. When I went back up to my room, I noticed all the lights were off again. I looked outside to see the snow one more time. But this time, I saw something strange. There were new footprints in the snow. They started from my house, went across the road, and then disappeared behind my neighbor's house. I never found out who or what made those footprints. I try not to think about it too much. It's scary not knowing. When I was 16 years old, I was on a website called StickCam. It was a place where you could chat with other people. I started talking to some hackers on a program called Ventrilla. I made a big mistake and took a file from one of them. I don't remember what they told me the file was for. I said I was going to take a shower. When I came back, I saw the light of my webcam was on. I understood right away and felt very silly. At least my webcam had a light to show it was on. My mom's close friend visited us. She brought her boyfriend as well. He acted strange, like something wasn't right about him. After a week, my mom's friend broke up with him. He got very angry and killed her in a terrible way. While they were looking for the killer, my mom told the police she thought it was him. She was certain. Later, we found out that my mom had been alone with her friend's killer in our home without knowing. One time, I got a scary call saying someone wanted to hurt me. Later, a dark car started driving by my house, stopping close to where I was. Then, a man holding a big knife walked by my house, looking inside to see if anyone was there. When the car parked a few blocks away, I ran to my neighbor's place. They were the ones who called the police, while I called my mom and dad because I was alone. I was so scared I could barely speak, almost crying the whole time. I thought it was just a random person wanting money or something. It took me many years to stop feeling scared about that. I moved into an old two-story house in a rough part of town where I planned to live for more than three years to save money for buying my own place. The first thing I did was make the house safer. I changed the lock on the front door and replaced the old doorknob with one that could lock. The windows were old and easy to break into and the back door was just a glass door leading to a wooden deck. So, I bought some strong wooden boards and cut them to fit in the tracks of the windows and back door to stop anyone from breaking in. I think the person who lived here before me sold illegal drugs. In the first six months, people looking for drugs knocked on my door four times, asking for someone named Alex. Some of them left when I said Alex didn't live here, but a couple got upset and wanted to know where Alex went. After these visits, I made sure to lock all the doors every time. But once, I forgot to lock the front door and had a scary experience. One evening, while I was making dinner, I went to use the bathroom. When I came back, I saw a man in black clothes in my kitchen. He had come up the stairs from the front door. I asked him who he was, and he looked surprised. He said he was there to fix the bathroom. I was scared and thought I might have to defend myself. I grabbed a knife from the kitchen. The man quickly said that my landlord, who he called John, had sent him. I told him John wasn't my landlord and that my bathroom was fine. He realized he was at the wrong house, said sorry a lot, and left quickly. I'm not sure if he was looking for Alex to settle some debt, or if he had a bad plan in mind but changed it when he saw me, or maybe he was just a confused guy who went into the wrong house. But after that, I never left my door unlocked again. A few winters back, in the deepest chill, I found myself alone at home. My mom and dad had left to celebrate a friend's birthday at a local pub, and my younger sister was having fun at a sleepover at our cousin's place. 
It was just me and our dog Rex in our house, which felt a bit spooky late at night. I'm not a fan of being alone, mainly because I don't think I could protect myself if I needed to. Being a 15-year-old girl who's barely over 5 feet tall, I'm not exactly strong or intimidating. Plus, I get scared pretty easily, which doesn't help in situations like this. It must have been close to 11 p.m. I paused my movie and got up to grab some snacks and feed Rex. When I walked into the kitchen, I noticed Rex was fixated on our back door, his growl low and continuous. The door had a glass panel, and beyond it, everything was swallowed by the night's darkness. Do you need to go out? I asked him, trying to see if that would snap him out of it. But Rex just kept growling, his gaze locked on the door. I figured he was either spooked by nothing or maybe he'd spotted a critter outside. Adding to the atmosphere, the house creaked and groaned more than usual that night. Each sound made me jump, my heart racing a little faster each time. The silence between those noises felt heavy, like the quiet was watching me. I tried to calm my nerves by talking to Rex, hoping to hear his tail thumping on the floor in response, but he remained tense, his attention never wavering from the dark glass door. I couldn't shake the feeling that maybe this time, it wasn't just my imagination running wild. Maybe Rex was growling at something, or someone, lurking just beyond our sight, hidden in the night's embrace. Rex is small, but she acts like she's big and strong. I took some food from the cupboard and walked over to Rex by the door. Just as I picked her up to bring her to my room, the light outside that turns on when it senses movement lit up. Looking out, I expected to see an animal running off, but instead, I saw a man. He was in a dark hoodie, and his face was hard to see. But I could feel his eyes on me. We looked at each other and then he ran, jumping over the fence into the yard next door, leaving deep footprints in the snow. This scared me a lot. I started crying and called my mom, who sounded like she had been drinking, and told her what happened. She got really scared over the phone, and I could hear her telling my dad about it. They said they would come home right away and told me to call the police in the meantime. After hanging up, I called the police and told the person on the phone everything. The lady on the phone helped calm me down because I was really scared and having trouble breathing. She said it would be okay and that the police would come fast. It felt like forever, but it was probably only ten minutes later when I heard knocking. It was the police. Talking to them made me feel a little better. They said they would check the backyard and wait for my parents. My parents came home soon after. They hadn't been far. The police said they would keep a car nearby for safety. They told us about a house not far from ours that had been broken into recently. The footprints in the snow at our place matched those at the other house. This made all of us very worried. But the police said they would keep an eye on our area. I never learned what happened to the man, but I really hope they caught him. Last Thursday, something happened that I can't shake off. I am a 30-year-old woman living with my partner and our two dogs. We have two huskies. One is two years old, and the other is just four months old. These huskies are the friendliest dogs you'll ever meet. They don't bark or howl. They simply adore people too much. Even when my brother-in-law or friends come over unannounced, the dogs don't make a sound. So it was around 8 p.m., dark outside, and I was alone at home. My partner had gone to play a hockey match, and I was in the bathroom with the door shut using the hairdryer. It was so loud I couldn't hear anything else. Suddenly I heard one of the dogs howl. I turned off the hairdryer and listened, thinking maybe the dogs were fighting again. Then I heard a soft knock, and the dogs started to lose it. They were barking, howling, and slamming into the bay window so much I feared they would break it. I wondered what on earth was making them act so wild. Perhaps it was another animal, like a dog or a skunk. I went to check from my bedroom window since it was closest to the front door. To my surprise, I saw two men wearing black hoodies standing there. They knocked loudly this time. My two-year-old husky leaped from the bay window to the front door, growling and throwing himself against the door. I was watching from my room as he did this. One of the men got scared, looked at his friend, and they both walked off. I immediately called my partner, telling him to come home as soon as possible. I watched the men as they walked away down the street. They weren't selling anything and didn't stop at any other houses. I was incredibly frightened. 
I'm just grateful for my brave dogs. I live in a very quiet place with not many people around, at the end of the road where no one else goes. At this time, my Aunt Sarah, who lived not too far away in our street, was having trouble with her kitchen sink. My dad is really good with fixing stuff. He can repair or make almost anything, so he said he'd help her out. My mom and brother were not home, but I, being 16, was used to being at home by myself. It was a bright and sunny day in the middle of summer but my dad still said he'd come back now and then to make sure I was okay. He went over to Aunt Sarah's to fix the sink, and true to his word, he came back a few times to check on me. My room is upstairs, in the corner of our house. To see anyone coming in, I have to go out of my room and look down the stairs, which are right in front of the front door. It's not a long distance. The stairs are pretty close to my room, and whenever my dad came back to see how I was, I'd step out to talk to him from the top of the stairs. About an hour after my dad last came to check on me, I heard the front door open. Our door is really old and makes a specific sound because of the chimes attached to it, so you can hear it open from anywhere inside. Right after the door opened, my dad called out to me, asking if I was doing okay and if I needed anything to eat. While talking to him, I started to move towards my door so I could go to the landing and talk to him without yelling. But as I was walking towards it, my phone started ringing. I turned back to my bed to pick it up, and the screen showed Dad calling. The eeriness began to sink in. My heart skipped a beat. How could my dad be calling me if he was supposed to be right outside my door? The warmth of the sunny day turned cold and a chill ran down my spine. I stood frozen for a moment, the phone still ringing in my hand. Questions raced through my mind. If the man at the door wasn't my dad, then who was he? And what did he want? Seeing dad on my phone made me stop for a second. I thought maybe my dad called me by accident because his new phone sometimes calls people when he didn't mean to. Dad, did you call me? I shouted towards the stairs and answered the phone, half-jokingly saying, Hello? What I heard next made my heart stop. It was my dad's voice saying, Hey, just finishing things up here. I'll be back home in a bit. I couldn't say a word. I was hearing my dad talking to me on the phone, but also hearing what sounded like his voice from the living room below. Quietly, I asked, Dad, where are you right now? He told me he was still at Aunt Sarah's place, just as we had talked about. I could hear Aunt Sarah and her kids in the background of the call. Then my dad on the phone asked if I was hungry, just as I heard the front door of our house open and shut. I started sweating, trying to figure out what was happening. My heart was racing, and I was scared. I told my dad on the phone to stop joking because he just left through the front door. He seemed confused and said the last time he was home was around 1 p.m., asking me what I was talking about. In our house, there are 15 steps from the top floor to the bottom. I raced down those steps in just a couple of seconds and ran out of the house, heading to Aunt Sarah's without even putting on shoes. I can't remember if I closed the door behind me. By the time I reached Aunt Sarah's, I was crying and shaking, unable to explain what had just happened. I try to forget that day, but the memory of it keeps coming back haunting me. When I was about 12 years old, I was staying at a friend's house of my family. Our parents were out for the evening, having a good time together. It was me, my younger brother who was nine, and two sisters aged 13 and nine, who actually lived in that house. We spent the night watching old horror movies from the 80s and snacking on all sorts of treats. Around one in the morning, the youngest sister stopped the movie because she needed to use the bathroom. In no time at all, she rushed back to us in the living room, her face white with fear. She gasped out that there was someone trying to climb in through the bathroom window. Since I was the oldest kid there, I forced myself to act brave and went into the kitchen to get a big knife. Then, all four of us tiptoed to the bathroom, hoping whoever was outside would run off as soon as they saw the lights and heard us coming. So I turned on every light as we made our way there. When we reached the bathroom, I flicked on the light and peeked inside. True enough, I saw two hands silently removing the window's glass panels, one after the other. We started to shout, making it seem like the house was full of people. But the intruder didn't stop. Out of the window's ten panels, three or four were already out. If he managed to take them all off, he could easily get inside. I thought about slashing at his hands with the knife, 
but I was scared he might grab it from me. I was terrified, but I tried to appear calm and in charge. Meanwhile, my brother and sisters were starting to cry softly. Then I remembered they had an old Labrador sleeping in the living room by the fireplace. I didn't think twice. I dashed to the living room, picked up the dog, and carried him to the bathroom, pointing his muzzle towards the window and the intruding hands. The dog exploded into furious barking and growling. The hands paused and I hoped they would just go away. Thankfully, the person behind the window backed off, and for the rest of the night, we stayed close together in the living room, knives in hand, keeping the dog alert and sending him to check the bathroom every hour. Finally, our parents returned and immediately called the police, who came and took fingerprints from the outside of the bathroom window. We never heard back from them. That night was the most terrifying experience I've ever had. When I was younger, my mom worked nights as a bartender. It was just us, so I looked after my younger brother Sam when she was at work. One evening, as I was cooking dinner, I kept hearing this weird whistling noise. There was a big storm happening outside, so I didn't think it was anything strange at first. But the whistling kept going, and it started to sound like someone was playing a tune, rather than just random noise from the wind. It made me feel uneasy, so I asked Sam if he heard it too. He didn't. The whistling eventually stopped, but the storm was still raging outside. Later that night, when it was time for bed, I climbed down from the top bunk in our room. Suddenly our TV turned off by itself. I thought maybe the power had gone out, but the light in the hallway was still on. I tried to turn the TV back on, but it didn't work. When I checked behind it, I found that it had been unplugged. Right then I heard the whistling again, but this time, it was right next to me, as if someone was standing there whistling into my ear. I could almost feel their breath on me, and it made my whole body shiver with fear. I remember that feeling even now. Without thinking, I ran out of our apartment screaming for help. We lived in a building with three other apartments, and the noise woke up our upstairs neighbors, a young couple with two kids named Mike and Julia. They offered to help and check our place. I could tell Mike thought I was just a scared kid imagining things, but he wanted to help me feel better. Sam and I waited outside while he went in to look around. After a few minutes, he came back out looking a bit annoyed, asking if we were playing a joke on him. I was really scared by then, and I told him no, we weren't. He must have seen the truth on our faces because I saw his expression change to fear. He said he didn't find anyone, but he felt like someone was in there. They didn't want us to stay by ourselves, so they let us stay with them until my mom came home from work. I never heard that whistling again after that night, but weird things kept happening to us in that apartment. I'm sure that place was haunted. I was about 15 or 16 years old. My mom, her new husband, my brother, and his girlfriend had gone out to the nearby bar for maybe an hour before everything went wrong. I was at home just with my twin sister. We're both girls. We had just finished watching Mamma Mia, a movie we both love. Just as the movie ended and we were about to get some food from the kitchen, I heard a knock on the door. It was around eight or nine in the evening. Not too late, really. There was a man, maybe around 40, standing outside, his face pressed against the window of the door. I froze right there, watching him try to peek inside. He bent down to the mail slot and said in a creepy voice, Hey, little girls, let me in. I whispered to my sister to hide in the kitchen. Then I saw that we hadn't locked the front door. I slowly walked over, keeping my eyes on him, and managed to put the chain on. We didn't have the key. I ran back to where my sister was, and she was already calling our mom. We tried to speak quietly, begging them to come back quickly, but mom couldn't make out what we were saying at first. Finally, she got it and told my brother and her husband who ran back to us. The whole time, the man kept talking through the mail slot, asking us to open the door. We were hiding, holding our dog and a knife, scared. About five to 10 minutes after we called, my brother and stepdad arrived. They checked on us first, saying they didn't see anyone outside. They thought he might just be a drunk man, but the fear I felt was deep. It was the first time something so scary happened, and calling the police didn't even come to my mind right away.
One evening when I was about 12 or 13 years old, my mom and dad were out, and I decided to stay up way past my bedtime. It was after midnight, and there I was, sitting in front of my old computer, waiting for them to come back. I knew I shouldn't be talking to people I didn't know on the internet. My parents had warned me many times, but half of my chat friends were people I'd never met in person. That night, I was messaging several of them on a chatting app. Suddenly, one of my internet buddies sent me a message that chilled me to the bone. He detailed exactly what I had been doing for the last couple of hours. He knew I'd been snacking, what I was drinking, even the small toy I'd been fiddling with at my desk. He described when I had last stood up, all things I was sure I hadn't mentioned in our chat. A wave of fear washed over me. My computer was right in front of a large window, and it struck me that this person, who was supposed to be in another country, might have somehow found out where I lived and been watching me. I soon discovered the truth was even more disturbing. He hadn't been outside my window. Instead, he had hacked into my computer's webcam. I always left it connected, despite warnings that it wasn't safe. This person had been invading my privacy, watching me through the webcam whenever he felt like it. Now, years later, the fear from that night still lingers. I keep all my cameras covered with tape, paranoid about my privacy being invaded again. That night taught me a terrifying lesson about the dangers lurking in the online world. A lesson I'll never forget. Some years back, I found myself all by myself at home. My husband had to go to another state for work. I turned on the news on our Samsung TV in the living room, left the remote on the small table in front of the couch, and walked into the kitchen to start making dinner. After a little while, I realized the noise from the TV had stopped. I thought maybe there was a problem with the signal, or perhaps the TV had turned off by itself after a while. When I walked back into the living room, I saw something that made me stop in my tracks. The TV screen was showing a picture of a sofa in a living room. But it took me a moment to understand that it was not just any living room, it was mine. I was seeing a live feed of my own living room on the screen. The remote control was still exactly where I left it, so there was no way our dog had accidentally stepped on it and changed anything. A couple of days after this scary event, there was a report on the news. It turned out that Samsung TVs had a problem they could be hacked into. This made me wonder how many times someone might have watched me through that camera before I decided to cover it up with tape. A few years ago, something really scary happened to me. It's a story I'll never forget. Let me set the scene. I was in college, living alone on the second floor of an apartment building. To save some money, I used to keep my balcony doors and windows open instead of using the air conditioner. During this one week, my big dog, who usually scares people away with his loud bark, was staying at my boyfriend's place. And guess what? I forgot to lock my front door. It was a big mistake. One night, I was sleeping without any clothes on because it was so hot. Suddenly, I woke up in the middle of the night. It took me a moment to understand what was happening, but then I saw it. A man was standing right there in my bedroom. I was so scared and didn't know what to do. Getting up wasn't an option because I had no clothes on. So without thinking much, I yelled at him, Hey, what are you doing here? His answer was so creepy. He said, I came to close your doors and windows. That's when I looked around and saw that he wasn't lying. All my doors and windows were indeed shut. Right after he said that, he left my room. I quickly got up, locked my door, and started crying. It was one of the most terrifying nights of my life. When I was about 10 years old, something scary happened. I was taking care of my younger sister, who was seven. We lived close to a mental hospital. Sometimes people who were being treated there would escape and end up in our backyard. They would leave the hospital, walk through the forest, aiming for the closest big city. But after walking a mile to our place, they'd realize that the city was too far away, about 40 miles. So, they would come to our house, asking to use our phone to call the hospital to come and get them. This kind of thing happened from time to time, but this time it was different because it was the first time it happened when my parents were not at home. So imagine this. I was alone at home with my sister. 
A woman showed up in our driveway, and she wanted me to call the hospital for her, but she also asked me for matches. Maybe she wanted to smoke. I quickly took my sister inside and locked all the doors before I made the call. The woman outside was making strange noises, a mix of yelling and groaning. Matches! I need matches! She kept saying until someone from the hospital came to take her back. I thought she just wanted them for a cigarette. But a scary thought crossed my mind. What if she wanted them to set our house on fire? So I didn't give her any. A few years ago, I lived in a very quiet place, far from the city. My house was surrounded by big trees and fields of tall plants. One night I was alone at home and decided to go outside on my small front space to smoke before bed. There I was, enjoying my smoke, and halfway through I took a big breath and let out the smoke. Suddenly, the smoke shaped into a face right in front of me only a little distance away. I got so scared, I threw my cigarette on the ground, ran back inside and made sure all the doors were locked tight. It was the most scared I've ever been in my life, 